Okay, so let's talk about shorelines. Uh, here we see a picture of some waves breaking on the shore. And waves do a lot of work uh, geologically. They move sediment around, they deposit sediments in some places, and they erode sediments in others. Um, a lot of the work of erosion by waves is done by the, the particles they carry, right? That water is moving so it can carry um, small sediments, up to, sometimes very large sediments. And those sediments, as they gouge the shoreline, they scrape away stuff and they contribute to weathering and erosion. Also, when waves crash on cliffs and things like that, they drive air into cracks um, and can also wedge things apart and, and so on. So waves do a lot of work. So the basic parts of a wave uh, are shown in this diagram here. So waves get their energy from wind. Wind blows across the surface of the water and transfers energy. And that energy of motion is propagated through the water. You see the motion of waves is, is circular. We can see this here. So the, the, the general motion is circular. Um, and the, the, the amount of motion is larger, of course, at the surface and then uh, decreases as you go farther down. Um, you know, if you imagine a ship sitting on the, the ocean, the ship doesn't kind of, it drifts along because of wind, but if it's just moving on the waves, it's kind of making a circular motion. It's bobbing up, going down, bobbing up, going down. Um, so some, some basic terminology, the height of a wave is the, the distance between the crest or the top of a wave and the uh, trough of the next wave. And the wavelength is the distance between one crest and another crest. So that's the wavelength. Um, when you get about a half, one half wavelength down in depth, uh, that's where the motion of wave action is pretty negligible. So when waves are moving, um, the energy that's moving through those waves, it's not actually moving the molecules of water very much. So out here where the, where the water's deep, um, the motion is that circular motion. Um, but any given water of molecule is not really moving very far. It's kind of moving up and down and around that circle. But as we get shallower towards the shore, um, and we get uh, shallow water that's less than a half of wavelength deep, then those waves start to, what we say, touch bottom. Uh, and so friction starts to slow down the movement of water up here, and these, uh, the water up here keeps moving, and so that's when we get breakers form, and the water piles up until it's so high that it, that it splashes down, crashes on the beach, and this is where you get deposition of sediment and also um, movement of sediment as the waves fall back down the slope of the beach. Okay, if we talk about landforms, then we've got basically two types of shorelines. This is the coast of California. Here's San Francisco right here. And one thing that you might notice here is that we've got a lot of relief. Uh, the shoreline, as this is a Royce map, so um, relief is shown with uh, black ink. And so we see a lot of ink here because we've got mountains and cliffs and things that go right up to the edge of the ocean. Another thing you notice on uh, shorelines like this, like on the west coast, the Pacific coast of North America. Um, again, this is the coast of Oregon, and we see um, a lot of relief, so we see cliffs and things right along the, the edge of the ocean, but we also see the shoreline is very straight, right? It's a very straight line. There's not a lot of stuff jutting out, and we call shorelines like this emergent coastlines. So an emergent coastline looks a lot like this, uh, so again, this is the coast of California, and we see cliffs that go right up to the ocean, and out here we see little sea stacks and chunks of rock that have been eroded away. Um, and so emergent coastlines are areas where we have a lot of relief. Uh, the land has risen up relative to the, to, the, to the sea level, or the ocean has dropped relative to the land, right? So we have land emerging from the ocean. So along emergent coasts, we get a lot of landforms like this. Uh, so again, we have sea cliffs, and uh, we have a, you know, a beach at the bottom of those sea cliffs. Um, we also get where places where the land juts out into the ocean, we get things like sea stacks, a little pile of rocks that was formerly connected to the, to the mainland, and we get sea arches and sea caves and things like that. Um, another interesting landform we get along emergent coasts is a tombolo. So here we have a little sea stack here, and sand has been deposited out, forming a peninsula like that. Um, again, here's um, an emergent coastline, and here we have what's called a marine terrace. So here we have a marine cut or a wave cut platform over here. So you see the wave action has eventually worn away at the coastline and kind of leveled this off. And here we have a terrace here. What we have here is a series of uplift. 
So if the land uplifts relative to the coastline, uh, the waves wear that land flat, and then we have another series of uplift, and another cliff is formed, and so on and so on. Uh, so we can get a series of terraces. Now, why are those coastlines straight, like I showed you the map of the coast of Oregon? Uh, the main reason why the shorelines are straight is anything that juts out. So here we have a rocky headland with a little lighthouse on it. And anything that juts out gets attacked by wave action and eroded quickly because of the refraction of waves. So not only are these waves crashing up against the headland right straight on, but as the waves start to touch bottom, the, the, the land is shallower around the headland here. So the waves, you can see how they're bending because they're touching bottom over here and they're not touching bottom over here. And so the waves tend to bend and hit the sides of this headland as well, as you can see in the arrows there. So the headlands get worn away really, really quickly. So you get things like this. Here's a sea stack out on the left and a sea arch on the right. And so this is an area where a headland has been eroded by refraction of waves and that's what's formed that sea arch. It's worn away underneath, undercutting that, that headland. The sea stack that's left out there was the, was the beginning, it's the remnants of an old sea arch, right? So the sea arch got eroded so much that the top collapsed and what you have is a sea stack. So you usually have this progression. If you have a rocky headland that juts out into the ocean, wave refraction will first come around and clear out what we call a sea cave. If, if it clears the sea cave all the way through, so you can see through it like here, we call that a sea arch. And then if the arch collapses and leaves a pile of rock out there, it's called a sea stack. Now the other main kind of coastline is called submergent coastlines, and that's sort of the opposite. In the submergent coastline, the sea level has risen relative to the land, or the land has subsided relative to the, to the ocean. So you can think of submergent, submerging land. And this is the kind of coastline we see on most of the Atlantic coast of North America, as well as the Gulf Coast. So here you can see both a satellite image on the left and a map on the right of the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay. And these are examples of estuaries. So estuaries are places where sea level was lower in the past and sea level has risen and flooded old river valleys. So you can see how you get this really irregular coastline. It's not straight like um, along the coast of Oregon. It's made up, these, it's made up of these flooded river mouths. Now another really interesting dynamic um, aspect of shorelines is the movement of sand along the shoreline. And we often see this uh, shown by longshore current or longshore drift. So usually uh, the wind is not gonna blow straight on into the coast. It's usually gonna be blowing and the waves are gonna be hitting at some angle, right? So you can think of this as if you're a piece of sand, if you're a particle of sand being pushed up the beach by the wave, a wave coming in at some angle, and then as the wave comes back down, the wave comes back down perpendicular to the, to the shoreline. It comes down the slope of the beach. So it comes up driven by the wind and falls back down by gravity. So if you're a particle of sand, you get pushed up the beach and then back down and pushed up the beach and back down. And so the beach drifts. It migrates in the direction of the prevailing wind. You might have experienced this. If you've ever gone to the beach when you're a little kid and you go out there and you're playing in the waves, um, you know, maybe you walked right to the beach from the towel where mom and dad are. And um, then, you know, you look back a, a few minutes later and you look back at the beach and mom and dad are gone. And the reason is because you've drifted along. The, the path of the waves have kind of pushed you along too. So you can experience this firsthand. But what this means is that shorelines typically have a sand budget right? Sand comes in in some places, so like the input from a river, that'll deliver new sediment to the beach. Uh, and then there's outputs, you know, sometimes storms will drag water, uh, sand way out into the deep water where it can't really come back to shore, or it gets dragged along by longshore current. So beaches can either gain sand or lose sand at different times under different conditions. So here's some examples of some drifting sand creating some landforms. This is the coast of Massachusetts. And uh, drifting sand, with the longshore drift can create things like a spit. A spit is a little peninsula of sand uh, formed by the longshore current drifting uh, that sand in, in one direction. Spits usually have this curl shape to them. You can see the inset picture here of the Provincetown spit. And you can see the direction of the longshore current is this way and then this way, uh, the waves pushing that sand um, along. 
If you get a uh, longshore drift that blocks a bay, so here we have a river coming into the, to the shore, and we have longshore drift pushing the sand this way, it can choke off that, that bay, uh, and that's called a bay mouth bar. Now, uh, the movement of sand can be very inconvenient for people, and so there's a lot of different um, engineering sort of features that folks use to try to control this, this beach drift. As we've been reading John McPhee, The Control of Nature, uh, it's another prevailing theme on coastlines as well. So like I said in the last slide, baymouth bars can cut off uh, you know, a river inlet or, or a bay or something like that. And often we, that's very inconvenient because maybe we want to get in there. So here you see in this picture, uh, we've got a nice marina back here. Uh, but if the, if the longshore drift went this way and closed off that outlet, then those boats would no longer be able to get out into the ocean. So we can build something called jetties. And jetties are just two long um, projections, and usually made of concrete or they can be made of um, piles of rock or something like that. And what jetties do is they keep that channel open. And so you see here, uh, if the longshore drift is coming this way, uh, the waves will hit the, the upstream jetty here and drop their sand. And so you see the beach is growing here. And you can see that down in the bottom slide too. Um, right here, uh, notice how wide the beach is here. It's been growing because the waves are stop it, stopped by the jetty and depositing sand. Now on the other side though, if the if the waves come around, they refract around the other jetty. Now they've dropped their sand back here. So uh, now those the water is clean and has more capacity to pick up new sediment. So over here, these waves refract around here and they can erode the beach. And so now the beach erodes away here and you can see how narrow the beach is over here. So that causes a problem. Sometimes what you have to do is you have to dig up the sand on the up upstream side and truck it around and then dump it over here to keep to keep that beach in equilibrium or you can build very expensive pipes that go underneath the jetty and pipe the sand underneath um, but in any, any case it's a constantly changing situation similarly uh, if you have longshore drift that kind of takes sand away from the beach uh, you can build a groin. So a groin is like a jetty, it's just one projection that comes out here to stop sand. So if the longshore drift is going this way. The problem is, just like a jetty, if you build a groin here, it, your beach will start growing, but your neighbor's beach will start eroding because the, the clean water that comes around and refracts will wear out their beach. So then your neighbor has to build a groin and then their neighbor has to build a groin and so on and so on and so on. Um, so that can be, um, and then, again, a situation that requires constant maintenance. Another way we can uh, change the dynamics of beach uh, of beaches is we can build a breakwater. So a breakwater here, you can see this one at Santa Monica, California. It's basically just a big pile of rock or concrete that's put out there uh, parallel to the shoreline. And so what that does is it creates calm water back here. And so we have a nice little uh, anchorage for boats in calm water because it's blocking the breakers from coming in. But what that means is um, now the longshore drift is weakened here. And so it creates um, a lot of uh, the beach will grow out that way because now the, these waves are no longer are being blocked. And so they drop their sediment. And then you can get, again, more longshore drift down here, which can cause the beach to narrow. Um, sometimes uh, places will build seawalls along the uh, along the coast, and that's to protect structures and, and towns and things built along the, the ocean. The problem is, if you build a seawall, you notice these waves are crashing up against the seawall. Um, those waves don't have a chance to dissipate, at, like on a long beach, where they would dissipate and slow down and drop their sediment. So when the waves are crashing against the seawall, there's a lot of energy and they remove sediment, but they don't deposit any sediment. So eventually they end up wearing down the seawall. So if, when you build a seawall, it eventually gets worn down and you have to build another seawall. So um, again, trying to control the, uh, the shoreline pro uh, processes can be problematic and endless. Another way that people deal with their beaches being eroded is what's called beach nourishment. And all that is, is bringing in sand and dumping it there uh, as a way to keep the beach wider. So here we've got a narrow beach that's been narrowed by, um, by longshore drift. And you can see all the, the trucks and things bringing in sand to widen the beach. Again, this beach will eventually wear away and you'll have to do it all over again. 
There are some other ways of doing it. You can dredge sand from offshore and spray it up on shore with, uh, with boats. There's many other different ways to do beach nourishment, but basically the, the process is the same. You dump more sand and eventually you have to dump more sand because it gets washed away. The last aspect of these coastlines that I want to talk about is barrier islands. So barrier islands are long strips of sand uh, that are offshore. So here down here we can see here's the, the ocean here. We can see the breakers on the beach. This narrow thing is a barrier island and then back behind it we have a lagoon. Along the east coast and the gulf coast of North America we have a lot of barrier islands, long strings of barrier islands. We can see some of them here. So again, here's the Chesapeake Bay up here, and we can see barrier islands out here. The uh, outer banks of North Carolina is a long strip of barrier islands. And here's the lagoon back here, Pamlico Sound, Albemarle Sound behind them. This is sort of a cross section of, of a barrier island. They're very dynamic. The sands are constantly shifting. There's lots of deposition. There's lots of erosion. Uh, severe storms can, can um, tear new inlets into those barrier islands and, and change the shape of the islands. It's a very, very dynamic situation, um, not stable at all. So there's hazards of living and building on barrier islands. This is the deadliest natural disaster in the history of the United States. This was a, a hurricane that hit Galveston Island in Texas um, in 1900, the summer of 1900. Um, because all of this stuff was built on sand and the storm can do a lot of damage to, um, to move that sand, building foundations, buildings collapsed, foundations moved, um, not to mention it was a severe storm with huge flooding that flooded across the whole island um, and about 8,000 people died in this. And there's horrific stories of, you know, trying to dispose of bodies and, and you know, dumping them in the ocean and having them wash back up. And uh, it, was a, it was a really horrible, horrible scene. So you think we'd learn our lesson uh, not to build on barrier islands uh, because they're inherently unstable, very susceptible to storms, storm damage, flooding. Um, but we continue to build on barrier islands. This is Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, which is completely built on a, a barrier island. And again, here's uh, the barrier island near Galveston, Texas. Storms continue to hit, um, property continues to be damaged, and uh, people are injured and lives are lost.